The Jets have fired head coach Robert Sala. We're looking at the state of that franchise and other stories around the NFL. Plus, Allison Felix, the most decorated U.S. track and field Olympian in history, joins to talk about growing that sport beyond the Olympics and the new management firm that she's launching. We're also checking in on MLB, the U.S. men's national soccer team, and a hilarious new athlete deal. It's Wednesday, October 9th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. In today's episode, we're talking Robert Sala, Aaron Rodgers, Devontae Adams, and how NFL teams are constructed these days with a fantastic Andrew Brandt. We also have history-making Olympian Allison Felix on her new venture, the state of track, and what she wants to do as a new member of the IOC. My colleague Eric Fisher discusses MLB's big rating surge and what could happen to local broadcasts in the future. First, let's hit some headlines. ESPN and MLB are expected to negotiate a new deal before ESPN can opt out after the 2025 season. ESPN has cut down on its MLB programming over recent years and was expected to opt out of its contract with the league following next season. According to Puck's John Orand, ESPN is looking to obtain local media rights as well as a package of national games. With Diamond Sports hold on MLB crumbling and MLB looking to nationalize their local rights, the puzzle pieces may be coming together here for a new media future for baseball. Also in MLB, Dodgers manager Dave Roberts is claiming Manny Machado's throw towards the Dodgers' dugout in Game 2 of their series was likely directed at him. In a game that featured heated exchanges between Padres and Dodgers players, and even fans throwing objects from the stands, Roberts said that he didn't notice the throw at first. After reviewing footage of the throw, Roberts said, It was unsettling. If it was intended at me, I would be very... It's pretty disrespectful. So, I don't know his intent, I don't want to speak for him, but I did see the video, and the ball was directed at me with something behind it. To the legal sphere, Former WWE employee Janelle Grant, who filed a lawsuit accusing Vince McMahon of sexual battery and trafficking, is asking WWE to not enforce NDA agreements with other former and current employees. A statement from Grant's attorney said, If WWE and its parent company Endeavor are serious about parting ways with Vince McMahon and the toxic workplace culture he created, their executives should have no problem with releasing former WWE employees from their NDAs. Lawyers representing WWE and its executives have not commented on the request. Deshaun Watson has settled the latest civil lawsuit accusing him of sexual assault, according to the plaintiff's attorney, Tony Busby. Busby has represented 24 women accusing Watson of sexual assault or misconduct, with all ending in settlements for the quarterback. While the settlement is confidential, the plaintiff was seeking $1 million in damages from the Browns quarterback. Staying with the NFL, in a shocking move, the New York Jets fired head coach Robert Sala after a 2-3 start to the season. Jets owner Woody Johnson said in a statement, This morning, I informed Robert Sala that he will no longer serve as the head coach of the Jets. I thanked him for his hard work these past three and a half years and wished him and his family well moving forward. This was not an easy decision, but we are not where we should be given our expectations, and I believe now is the best time for us to move in a different direction. We'll have more on Sala's firing and other NFL news with former NFL executive Andrew Brandt coming up next. I'm joined now once again by Andrew Brandt, Executive Director at the Morad Center for Sports Law at Villanova, host of the Business of Sports podcast, author of the Sunday 7 newsletter, and columnist at Sports Illustrated. Welcome, Andrew. Good to be with you, Owen. Always enjoy coming on with you. Yeah, great to have you back. So let's start with Robert Sala, fired by the Jets after a 2-3 start. A lot of angles here, particularly with Aaron Rodgers and everything they're invested into this contention window. Let's just, what's your initial reaction here to the firing? He wasn't a good coach. You know, you wouldn't put him at the top of the list. It didn't seem to be going well. And there seemed to be some differences of opinion with Aaron on some things that were going on, sort of the latest, this cadence issue over the last week or two. But I wouldn't put it all at his feet. What's happened with the Jets the past couple of years, Owen, they went all, all in on Aaron. They traded two high second round picks. They did a pick swap with the Packers. And I said it at the time, the Packers were never going to have Aaron Rodgers on that team. They had moved on. They replaced him with Jordan Love, just like we replaced uh, Brett Favre with Aaron Rodgers when I was there. And so for the Packers to get two high second round picks plus a pick swap, I thought that was really a lesson in uh, negotiation power by the Packers because... The Jets were the only team bidding. That's the leverage they had, but they gave up that for Aaron. And then, of course, this year, the Jets gave up a third-round pick, which could be a second, probably never be a second now, for Hassan Reddick, who's not even reporting, not even willing to 
is willing to forfeit eight hundred thousand dollars a week to not play for the Jets. So this is not a good look for the entire organization. And it is laid at the feet of the coach. We get it. Coaches make a lot of money. Coaches take the blame. So I would say this. I would say I would not have thought that Salah would be the first coach fired in the NFL. But the organization, it's not a good look for them. Yeah, I mean, the Jets right now kind of feel to me like one of those movies where they just have a stacked cast. It's like every celebrity you can think of, but like no right. one's really on the same page. And, you know, one of them is still still in their their trailer refusing to come out. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, on the, the Rogers piece of it, it this, you know, it's not like he's like a rookie second, third year quarterback who, you know, maybe has a big name, but is still coachable and can still, you know, have someone come in and say, here's the program and you're going to follow it. I feel like, you know, Rogers follows his own program. Yeah, I mean, you're talking personal here. I've known Aaron for a long time, but my my main uh, relationship with Aaron was very early in his career, young career. So we haven't had a lot of conversation over the past several years, but it just seemed to me coming into the situation being, again, I laughed when the opening press conference, Owen, when he said, I'm not here to be a savior. And every Jets fan was like, no, you are here to be a savior. It is exactly why you're here. It is exactly why there was so much buzz about the Jets a year ago. Of course, it all it all went to deflation when he injured his Achilles. But now he's back. He doesn't look the same. The team doesn't look what it is meant out to be with Brees Hall and this supposed great defense. It's just not working. Now, again... Their two and three is not the worst record, although they've won over the Titans and Patriots, so whatever. But uh, the relationship with Aaron is tough because, again, like you just said, he comes in as an established veteran, maybe one of the two or three biggest stars in the NFL. So he's going to have a lot of deference from the organization. You could see that. I mean, from the moment they flew out there while it was still property of the Packers, to kiss his ring and sit with him in Malibu for five hours and beg him, you know, that creates a power dynamic right away. So it is a difficult situation for Salah, for the GM, for the owner, because this is a big investment. When you take on Aaron Rodgers, like you said, you're not taking on a rising young quarterback that you have some power over. And again, I'm not in the camp that says Aaron's the GM, Aaron's the running the show, because I know Aaron. And Aaron is a, is a popular guy with his team. He was with the Packers. But I just think it's tough to manage that when you're coming in as a veteran. And as we saw, he brought in Alan Lazard. He brought in Randall Cobb. And don't tell me the Jets were doing that without Aaron's blessing. So this is the kind of thing that you deal with with Aaron. Yeah, um, there's been some amount of chatter. I don't. I don't know if there's been any actual reports, but about another big personality, uh, Bill Belichick potentially taking over the Jets' job. That feels like a stretch to me. But could you see that actually happening? Yeah, I could see it happening. My sense is like you, a little bit of a stretch because I think there is some hope within the organization that this Ulbrick, who's a highly thought of defensive coordinator, could maybe step into the role at least for a while. And there's also the feeling that at least I have, I don't base this on any inside information, that Belichick is comfortable and willing to spend the year, not half the year, but the entire year doing his media gigs, stepping away and being in the hiring cycle next year. It's just my feeling. So I would be surprised. Does this do anything for, to the market for Devontae Adams, who, you know, the Jets were one potential destination for him? I think they're in the mix. I mean, it's just hard to know because... I think we all feel that Devontae Adams is going to be somewhere else, but we don't know when. There is a deadline. You know my saying deadlines for action, but that deadline's not till November 5th, ironically, Election Day. So it's like it could happen this week, could happen next week. If I'm the Raiders, and I think they think this way, is there's no, uh, they're agnostic. You know, it's like who's ever the best offer. To me, it's like, in division, out of division, East Coast, West Coast, whatever the best offer. And if that's the Jets, sure. I mean, I think you see a guy that was a first traded by the Packers from for a first and second, and now they'll be lucky to get a second. I don't if they've been offered a second, I would think they would have traded them. I think they're waiting for the right offer. I don't know if the Jets panic and raise their offer with this news. It seems to me that wouldn't be prudent. But I could see Devontae Adams 
them going down to the wire saying we're just waiting for the best offer maybe is in the first of november somebody just gets a little desperate and makes and makes an emotional offer does the whole situation with adams does it say anything to you about the raiders organization more generally you know it's like the billy joel song i think it's something about trust it matter of trust it's like the cold remains of a passionate start <laughs> it was just it was so exciting they got Devonte. he's playing with his college quarterback they did a big extension on car then they just cut him six months later and adams is playing with lesser quarterbacks for two years you watch that quarterback th i mean that receiver thing on netflix he's you're feeling like he's just wants out uh, he's playing with these and and so it's it's a marriage gone sour it's not a long marriage but it's a marriage gone sour and it's too bad because uh it, it had a lot of promise by the way, Billy Joel quotes always welcome on this show, uh, as yeah. long as I'm in charge. <laughs> um, um, the whole situation with Rodgers and, of course, Deshaun Watson is barely holding on to his job. Yeah. Um, uh, Bryce Young has has now lost his job. And each of those was, you know, a, a team that traded a ton of picks, went all in on their guy. It can work. But when you put all your eggs in that in one basket, um, you know, you're things can go wrong and you, you don't have a lot of backup. And then we have other situations. I mean, you could sort of throw in Brock Purdy here, but I'm more thinking of like Sam Darnold, Baker Mayfield, um, who they're kind of found money for their organizations. I'm wondering if, I mean, obviously a superstar quarterback is the name of the game still, but do you see any organizations kind of rethinking how they approach team building, um, seeing how, badly it can go when you when you go all in and how well it can go when you just kind of try some guys it's a great question i mean obviously the best value in the history of the nfl is a quarterback in his rookie contract the chiefs had that for a while with Mahomes, the seahawks back in the day with wilson where they're adding all these veteran pieces around them and you see what's going on with brock purdy in san francisco they have so much top of the market guys with Ayuk, with samuel with kittle with McCaffrey, that we won't be able to do that much longer. Um, I don't know the answer. I think that what you have to do is analyze, is this your guy? And if it's your guy, it's usually a, an ascending player past his rookie deal that you have to make a decision on. And he, this past summer, I saw some decisions made on some guys. I'm like, oh, okay. They made a decision that Tua is worth that. I thought they'd ride it out with Tua. Dak Prescott, I thought the Cowboys would sort of ride it out. Of course, if he goes to free agency, he gets a massive contract like he just got. But I thought they would ride that out. And I mean, my reaction was, oh, I thought they would kind of let that go. But like you said, maybe there's some panic. The lame duck thing never seems to work out. Franchise tag, they don't want to get into it. A couple of years ago, my Giants friends are like, what are we going to do about why can't we can't pay Daniel Jones? I'm like, you have to. Unless you want to start over, you have to pay them. And when you pay these quarterbacks, you have to pay top of market or you'll lose them. So they could have let Tua go into next year. They could have let Prescott go into next year. Somebody would have paid him. We don't know what Tua's situation now, but it is something that is a tough decision. What we see, you mentioned a couple of guys, is maybe there's a mid-level out there, but you're not going to get the mid-level if they're part of your franchise growing up like a Daniel Jones, you're going to get a $30 million a year deal on Baker Mayfield on Geno Smith. Not that 30 million is a slouch number, but you're not going to pay 50 to 60 because with those guys, they're a middle tier player. They've sort of resurrected their career. And this is where Donald Darnold may be in next year, 25 to 30 million, which is actually cheap for a top level quarterback but otherwise you're paying full freight that's what happened with jordan love that's what happened with all to uh, all these guys that you have to make a decision are you going to pay it or are you going to take your chances and it seems like everyone's paying it I, I asked that question not really knowing what the alternative is other than to just kind of luck into you know you know one of these like kind of mid-career guys who has a resurgence which you know maybe that's like the next thing in scouting is is finding the that cast off who's actually still got it yeah i mean i think you look at tua was to me tua was a real test case because here's a guy coming to the end of his rookie contract they didn't extend him last year when a lot of guys in his class got extended 
and probably the next test case may be someone like, you know, Anthony Richardson, who's got a history of injuries. Are they going to do it? You know, <laughs> or are they going to play Russian roulette with a quarterback? You know, they're doing fine with Joe Flacco. But again, these are tough decisions that really define your franchise. Interesting stuff. Andrew Brandt, always a pleasure. Thanks for joining us on the show. Likewise, Owen. Always enjoy coming on with you. The U.S. men's national team brought in Mauricio Pochettino to do things differently from how they've been done before. And one thing he's doing differently is not pretending that this is a job he'll have forever. While most head coaches in any sport will reaffirm their commitment to the team in nearly any circumstance, Pochettino is already musing about potential future gigs. In an interview with CNN, the Argentinian discussed the potential of returning to his home country. Quote, well, I think it's clear that my club is Newell's old boys, and why not one day coach Newell's? It would be very nice. And logically, even though there are so many great Argentine managers, coaching the Argentina national team could happen as well if the opportunity presents itself. Barring something truly unexpected, Pochettino will lead the USMNT through the 2026 World Cup. After that, he may decide it's time to go home. Incidentally, his predecessor, Greg Berhalter, just found his next job. He'll be charged with leading the Chicago Fire out of last place in MLS. Over to college sports, a study commissioned by the NCAA, which ESPN obtained an excerpt of, found that at least 12% of the online abuse directed at college athletes has to do with sports betting. The majority centered around March Madness, but there were plenty even on sports that were way down the list in terms of betting activity like softball. I'm glad the NCAA is studying this. Anything they can do to tamp down online abuse of all kinds about anything is a good thing. This affects all athletes, but in this case, we're talking about kids, most of whom will never go pro. And to those people directing their anger at athletes because they lost a bet, you know, they say sometimes when you're angry at someone, it's really because you're angry at yourself. You're the one who made the bet. You could have taken the other side. After all, why do you think your betting platform offered you a sweetheart deal to join? It's because most of you are going to lose it back and then lose some more. The athlete is not the problem here. But some athletes can turn online abuse into personal profit. Arizona Cardinals quarterback Kyler Murray struck a deal with the video game series Call of Duty. The announcement video of the deal referenced a Reddit post from years ago that claimed to show that Murray's performance suffered on weeks where the game offered double experience points. Murray himself thanked, quote, the trolls that memed me into a bag, which is a sentence that would make no sense to someone 20 years ago. Murray does seem to be a gaming enthusiast. His original Cardinals contract included a clause that required him to study game film four hours per week and explicitly stated that he couldn't watch TV or play video games at the same time. Allison Felix is the most decorated track and field Olympian in U.S. history. That meant she was forging new territory just by succeeding at that level. Now she's looking to do that again in the space of athlete management and representation. She just launched a new firm, Always Alpha, as her next big project and the next big piece of her legacy. We spoke about all of that and how track can grow beyond the Olympics, and that's coming up next. I'm joined now by the most decorated American track and field athlete in Olympic history, Allison Felix. Welcome, Allison. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Great to have you on. So track had a big moment in the global consciousness, obviously, over the summer with the Olympics. Now we've got Athlos, this new track league just started. What do you think about the state of the sport right now? I think that we can take advantage of it. You know, um, I think it's always interesting, you know, just how we package our product and, you know, wanting to show up and really take the momentum from the games and do something with it. Because I think we always have a moment, you know, where the world is paying attention um, and they are, you know, engaged. And then uh, typically what has happened in the past is that it then falls off and we have to wait four more years to, to get back to this moment. So um, I think with new players in the space and new things happening and you have, you know, a more like we have sprint, you know, happening and television. And so um, I think I'm hopeful that we can take the momentum and keep going with it. Thinking about gymnastics in the same light where, you know, everyone gets excited about it every four years and then on the off years, most people aren't really thinking about it too much. Do you think track, you know, needs to grow beyond the Olympics the way, you know, like Simone Biles has her, like her tour that she does and there's something like Livy Dunn is kind of her own thing. Does track need to find those moments too? Yeah, absolutely. I think we need to get in front of new audiences. Um, we need to, you know, not just go the traditional route that we always have and, um, 
meet people where they are, you know, in order to gain new fans. I think there's been a lot of cool things, like you mentioned, Athlos and um, with the following of just athletes as individuals and what they have going on in their lives and their amazing personalities. And so really finding a way to get that across and, and bring people in for the full ride, not just, you know, the one moment at the games. Yeah, definitely. And I'm also wondering if NIL can play a role here because a lot of track athletes are college athletes. And then when they graduate, they have to figure out what they're doing other than that with their lives if they're not in the Olympics. Um, but now like there can be brands and companies that invest in these athletes and then have a vested interest in making them more of a, you know, a, a public figure. Yeah, absolutely. I think we've seen it a lot in women's basketball, you know, um, the investment at that stage. And then as they go pro and you see them, you know, on, on the bigger stage, um, they're able to show up there. And so I think that's a, a great model for a track also to follow and to really find those athletes who, um, who have a lot to give and who are great to follow as they continue on kind of before they hit that Olympic stage. Also wondering about your, your thoughts on the Olympics themselves, uh, like, you know, the International Olympic Committee. Obviously they, they've started to do a little bit more around uh, supporting their athletes. Uh, usually it comes from the country's Olympic Committee and how much they're doing. Um, but does the IOC maybe need to step up a little here in terms of you know, how much they accommodate their athletes and just like make it easier for them to participate. Yeah, I mean, I'm a new IOC member. So <laughs> this is my job now, <laughs> uh, <laughs> to really want to do things in a, a different way and just really be the athlete voice, you know, and I think there is a lot of things that we can do better and, and differently. And so I'm excited. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just starting off in that journey. I was elected in Paris. And so um, I got to work on the nursery before as a part of the IOC's athlete commission, but excited to bring more things like that. And like you're saying, making it an easier path for athletes to have a better experience there. Yeah. And could you just, uh, just unpack that a little bit? What's the nursery? Yeah, so the nursery, for the first time in the history of the Olympics, we had a nursery in the Olympic Village, which was huge. And the inspiration was really just my experience coming back um, to compete with my daughter. And it was really hard and challenging. And so um, to have a space in the village where athletes could bring their children and just bond and spend time together before their competitions um, was really cool. And so I looked to build that out uh, even further in L.A. Uh -huh, very cool. And just specifically as you can, what other changes or improvements would you, you are you going to push for as part of the IOC? Yeah, um, I know the Athletes Commission has really paid attention and wanted to do a lot around mental health. Um, there were some initiatives that were in place in Paris, but continuing to listen and to further that as well. And and I think the biggest idea is to to hear what's needed, you know, as things come up. And obviously we um, advocate for the athletes and whatever they're dealing with, but also want to bring new things to the table as well. And along those lines, uh, you've just launched a new venture. So Always Alpha uh, just launched. Congratulations. Yeah. What is it and why did you launch it? Yeah. Always Alpha is a management firm fully focused on women's sports. And so um, launched it because for me in my career, I didn't feel like there was ever anything out there. Uh, my brother managed my career and we really kind of pieced together things. There wasn't, um, from the jump, there wasn't this cohesive kind of strategy to let me show up fully as myself and, and be supported in that way. And I think a lot of, for a lot of female athletes, you feel that. There's been this traditional model um, that has really been focused on, on male athletes. And so saying that we believe that women should be treated in a, a different way, um, represented in a different way, and we want them to show up as themselves, and um, we will help them build their full business. And so excited to be in the space and, um, yeah, try to do things a little different. What would you say are the big gaps in the traditional representation model when it comes to women? Yeah, I mean, I look at some of the, the biggest um, female athletes in, in sports, and a lot of them have the same sponsors as Michael Jordan had years and years ago. And so having new brands, new players in the space, um, beauty brands, you know, things that we, we really haven't seen before. Um, and that's one of the, the big gaps that I'm seeing um, that we want to address. How, how do you feel like you're going to be able to 
uh, make an impact for for female athletes and also maybe provide a new model? Yeah. I mean, I really take um, kind of my career. I There was a lot of missteps there and a lot of things that I learned. And I also see this as a, a legacy piece. And I want to be able to give all of those gems to the to the people that we work with, the next generation, the women to, um, yeah, to really learn from some of the mistakes that um, that I made and just have an easier path. And so I'm excited to be able to provide that. And we're also a subsidiary of Dolphin Entertainment. So we are able to do this at scale. We have all the resources um, available to us. And I think that is really a game changer to be able to step in at day one and be able to, to do that. And, you know, not to make you like rehash things you wish you'd done differently, but <laughs> I'm curious, what do you mean by those mistakes that, uh, that you, you'd like to kind of, you know, not pass on to the next group of athletes? Yeah. I mean, when I look at the way that I built my brand and, you know, creating businesses, um, it was challenging. You know, I was always feeling like I was stuck in track and field and trying to get out. And it was just like a, a hardship, you know, and I feel like, you know, was able to make a lot of um, connections, relationships, networking. But I wish I had done that so much earlier in my career. It would have made things so much easier. I wish I would have thought about kind of the things that I wanted to do. And so to be able to provide that advice and more importantly, provide that plan um, for, for women athletes who want to show up fully as their self might already be thinking of something that they want to do down the line and helping them put that in place from day one is something I'm really excited to do. Yeah. And I'm sure there's, I mean, there probably wasn't the the management infrastructure just for anyone that you, when you were, in, we were competing, but also, yeah, especially for, for track and field athletes, for women, uh, perhaps for women of color, um, that just wasn't, you know, <laughs> just just anywhere close to where it is today. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I, I, yeah, it didn't exist. And so now, especially as women's sports is having so much momentum um, to show up across, you know, all of the sports and for broadcasters and for coaches as well, we are so excited to, to be in this space um, yeah, and hopefully have an impact. And are there any particular sports or areas that you think you'll focus on first? Um, I think, you, you know, not, no specific sport. We really look to have conversations with the top female athletes, you know, um, really leaders in the space. And so, um, yeah, we're excited to, to get to work. And what do the next, say, six months look like for you as you build out this brand? Yeah, I think it is it, it is that. It's building. It is, um, you know, really getting our, our team together, athletes, coaches, broadcasters, and um, – yeah, and, and getting them going with uh, the representation and, and showing up in all the spaces for them. All right. Very cool. Congrats again on the launch. Allison Felix, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thanks for having me. A medical test can reveal your body's biological age, which can show if you are aging prematurely. Better nutrition has been shown to reverse one's bio age. My hope of living longer and healthier is why I take Field of Greens. Field of Greens is an organic superfood fruit and vegetable drink unlike any other. It's serious nutrition. Listen to this. Field of Greens was approved for a university study that doctors believe may lower your body's biological age. That generally means better health. Each fruit and vegetable in Field of Greens was selected by doctors to support vital body functions like heart, liver, kidneys, metabolism, and immune system. Only Field of Greens is backed by this better health promise. At your next physical or checkup, your doctor will notice your improved health or your money back. Join me in better health with 15% off and free shipping. Visit fieldofgreens.com and use promo code FOS. That's promo code FOS at fieldofgreens.com. Fieldofgreens.com. Through the first two games of the division series, MLB playoff ratings are up 41% from last year on MLB, Fox, and TNT Sports. Meanwhile, the plates are shifting when it comes to local broadcasts. My colleague Eric Fisher has the latest, and he joins us next. Joined now by Front Office Sports newsletter writer Eric Fisher. Welcome, Eric. Hello. 
So the MLB postseason has been fantastic for ratings, especially compared to last year. What's the story here? Well, there's a lot of really great building blocks. And first and foremost, you got major star power, Shohei Otani making his first playoff appearance in his MLB career. You got Aaron Judge back in the playoffs, a bunch of other big stars. Uh, the series have been competitive as we're taping this. All four of the division series are tied 1-1, which has not happened in the nearly 30-year history of the division series. Uh, so they're guaranteed that at least 16 out of 20 games uh, in this round. The games themselves have been great. A lot of come from behind, a lot of drama uh, on the field. And then three out of the four division rivalries. So you've got a lot of sort of local enmity, you know, I mean, the Mets and the Phillies, those fan bases hate each other. Dodgers and Padres, same thing, you know, twins and guardians, maybe a little less spicy, but you know, that's a, you know, time tested divisional matchup as well. So, and then the Yankees and Royals have their own history going back decades. And so there's just a lot of great building blocks that sort of end up coming out the other side with these kind of robust viewership numbers that we've seen. Yeah, we've got a, an intra podcast team battle there with the the Mets and Phillies. Hopefully, <laughs> the the show will survive. Um, and is this you know a lot of it just luck of the draw, or is there anything structural here that MLB can point to? A lot of it is just really good fortune. I mean, you you know, obviously you want your best players uh, playing in your biggest games, uh, and given some of the inherent economic advantages that a team like the Dodgers has, you know, Sho Shohei Otani going from a team like the Angels to the Dodgers, the likelihood of him being in the playoffs as soon as he signed that contract went up significantly. But a lot of this just plays out on the field and you sort of see how it goes. And remember uh, going into the final week of the season, we didn't know the Mets were even going to be into the, into the playoffs. You know, we thought the twins were going to be there and then, you know, the Tigers kind of swooped in uh, with a la with a late charge. And so, you know, a lot of it is just luck. On, you know, the, the broader broadcasting landscape, obviously, the playoffs are their own thing. Uh, we're also going to see some changes to local broadcasts going forward uh, to, in a few different ways. So, uh, first of all, it looks like FanDuel is going to be taking over Diamond yep. Sports uh, the the naming rights so they're going yes. from Bally's, so Bally's to sports would become like FanDuel uh RSN or we don't know the exact nomenclature yet but it would be FanDuel at the front end of that name in some fashion yeah but that'll only affect Atlanta Braves broadcast as far as MLB is concerned that'll be N NBA and NHL teams as well right because that's all diamonds Correct. got left right yeah and meanwhile you still got this the fallout that's still unfolding from last week in which Diamond Sports Group uh, presuming they make it out of uh, bankruptcy, wants to go forward uh, with definitively only the Braves at this point in baseball. This is just speculation on my point, but I noticed in your story, you noted that um, FanDuel will likely take a single digit equity stake in yes. Diamond. I wonder if they're positioning themselves to maybe incorporate regional broadcasts into something like FanDuel TV or have some kind of, you know, make it more of like, this is the FanDuel network where you can watch your sports and you can place your bets. Yeah, and keep in mind that, and we're sort of going in a slightly different direction than postseason baseball, uh, but FanDuel and DraftKings uh, as well, they've made content operations part and parcel of what they do as a sports book that one hand really washes the other. And a big part of their sort of marketing spend and their marketing apparatus has been around this content development piece. And this would be a big step in, in FanDuel's case, but this is really an, an acceleration of a strategy that's really already been there for some number of years. Yeah, and getting back to national networks, uh, ESPN is um, the report is that they're looking for to opt, you know, ahead of their opt out after the 2025 season that they have in their MLB contract. They could also be getting into the local broadcasting game. How do you see them potentially being part of this puzzle? It's the ball's sort of in baseball's court at this point. And, you know, I had a story some weeks ago where the chairman of ESPN, Jimmy Patero, who is a big baseball fan, is like, we want to be part of the solution that he sees like everybody else. And as we're discussing here, that the traditional RSN landscape is the sort of in tatters and they've got a lot of resources at their disposal and they want to try to help where they can. It's just a matter of what they can do and what baseball is interested in having them do at the same time 
ESPN is sort of interested in recalibrating some of their broader baseball rights, that they've got some things like uh, the Home Run Derby that are a big tentpole for them. They've got some other pieces in their baseball contract they're perhaps a little less interested in. And so if there's an opportunity to maybe retailer some of those uh, assets and kind of refashion the, the baseball rights package, maybe bring some local rights into the mix as well, that's a, that's a conversation that Patero and the other leaders in Bristol would be very interested in having. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how this shakes out. And of course, we had Amazon was you know, uh, trying to, you know, worm their way in as well. Um, there's, there's a lot of rights to go around a lot of, and they, and they still, so they still could be a distribution partner for DSG if they get to the other side of bankruptcy. Right. Yeah. But I guess until that bankruptcy gets sorted out, even though we're down to one team, um, the yeah, MLB just kind of needs to know what they're playing with in, before they, they strike new deals. Yeah. And that's the thing where it's, chasing a very fast moving target and everything's sort of on a year to year basis and everybody's kind of trying to figure it out. Um, but the other piece of this is that wherever this kind of lands in the various ways, because I think there's going to be multiple answers to the sort of same overarching problem, uh, the whole model, the whole pie kind of shrinks because the traditional RSN model was based on getting revenue from people, whether or not they actually watch the games, that the, the those RSNs were part of the broader cable or satellite package, and that money just kept coming in regardless of whether those people actually watch the games. However, this nets out, whether it be over the air television, you know, a streaming based situation through Amazon, other structures, a combination of all of the above, it's going to be much more closely tied to actual game consumption. And that suggests a very different model and perhaps less money overall. Yeah, absolutely. Should be interesting to see how it all shakes out. Eric Fisher, thanks so much for joining us in the show. No problem. Time now for Front Office Sports Tomorrow, where we look ahead to what's coming in the business of sports. My colleague AJ Perez spoke with Utah Jazz and Utah Hockey Club owner Ryan Smith on the team's arena, its name because right now the hockey team's using a placeholder, and even looking ahead to the 2034 Winter Olympics in Salt Lake City. We basically got to take the upper bowl and put a lot of construction work in, and um, I think that that also sets us up in a really good spot. We, our goal is definitely to be the most um, unique arena for, for basketball. We don't want to lose any of the intimacy we have in basketball, but also be set up for hockey, which is rare. Normally when you go in, it's kind of the widest bowl and then they bring it in for basketball, we're going to be different. And so um, it's challenging, it's exciting. It will definitely set up well for the Olympics because I imagine this will be the hockey venue, um, which is pretty cool to have an NHL team there, um, locker rooms, everything else as you go into that. You're down to six finalists for the team name. How soon could we expect them yeah, to Yeah, I mean, but... it, to be honest with you, as soon as we get through this, like we can, can get the season started. That's the next order of operations, um, especially as, you know, we got to work a lot closer with the NHL and there's a whole legal process and everything else. So a lot of it's out of our hands, um, but we'll land in a great spot. And I think the good news is we've put out the base color scheme of how we're going to be no matter what it is. And, I think that's caught on really, really well, and um, people are excited about it. The finalists for the team name, by the way, are Utah Blizzard, Hockey Club, Mammoth, Outlaws, Venom, and Yeti. The correct choice here is Yeti, but really they should go Yetis. It's not like the whole team is one collective Yeti. Each of them should be a Yeti. Anyway, my two cents. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, tell us and tell a friend. You can leave us a review or find us on social media. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.